In the previous episode, I showed you how to connect your ESP32 to the internet and start sending data to Node-RED on your Raspberry Pi. In this episode, we're going to look at what we can do with that data to make it a little bit more useful. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a small change I'm going to be making to this project. I will be pivoting the use of this device so that instead of what I was going to do, which is to manage the humidity and temperature inside my grow tents, I'll still be able to do that, but I'm going to be actually using this to manage my hydroponic system. If you watched my recent video on my main channel, you would see that I showed you how to create a hydroponics device using some cheap components. And I talked about some automation I was gonna do with it. Essentially, there's only gonna be one change that I'm gonna be making to the device itself, and that is to add a new sensor. This here is a float switch, which can measure how far down in the reservoir the liquid is, so we can get an alert, and I know to go and fill it up. And that's it. Float switches are quite simple devices. Essentially what this does is when the water level rises, it's going to make this float up and it's gonna disconnect the switch. When it drops down and the water level is lower, then it's gonna be like that and it's gonna close the switch. So it's either gonna be on or off. There are two wires at the end and those two wires will go through to your device and I'll show you how to connect that in a second. All I've done is I've connected it to some cable and at the end a small plug and that will plug into the device but you can solder this directly onto your ESP32 it's really up to you. The only change we've made here is we've added this input over here. This is where we're going to plug in the float switch and there are two wires connected to that these two purple wires. One is going to IO16 and the other one is going to ground. Now what happens is when the float switch closes, it's going to pull IO16 down to ground because these two wires are gonna get connected together. Now I have mentioned this before in a previous episode, but to be able to do this properly, you need to have either a pull up or pull down resistor. In this case, we need a pull up resistor, but because the ESP32 has them built in, you don't need to go and do anything special, and I'll show you how to do that in code. As always, I will leave links down below so you can download the code that I'm using in these examples, and you can look at it at your leisure. But let's have a look at a couple of the things that I've added to incorporate the float switch. The first one is to specify a variable so that I know what the topic is for the float switch, and that's sending across to node red via MQTT. Next, we need to create a variable so that we can specify what the pin number is for the float switch. And that's what I've got here. That's a constant that's specifying pin 16. We then come down to the setup area and we need to change the pin mode for that specific pin. And we're changing that pin mode to input pull up. Like I mentioned before, we are pulling this down to ground when the switch closes, which means that we're gonna get a reading of zero. Now to make sure we get a reading of one, with the ESP32, the pins are 3.3 volts tolerant, which means that when it's high, when the pin is set to high or one, that means that it's reading around 3.3 volts. There's a little bit of tolerance. The problem is those pins are floating and sometimes you won't get an accurate reading and you won't necessarily get one when it should be one. So that's why we use an input pull up in this situation, or you could use an input pull down. So if I wasn't connecting pin 16 to ground, if I was connecting pin 16 to 3.3 volts, so when the switch closes that it goes high, then this here would be input pull down. If we didn't have a pull up or pull down resistor built in to the board like we do on the ESP32, then it gets a little bit more complicated. What you'd have to do is you'd be connecting in this example, pin 16 to 3.3 volts using a small resistor. And that would make sure that it's pulled high and it gives you a clean signal so that when it does pull down low, when it's connected to ground, when the switch closes, then you'd have a definite difference between one and zero, high or low, or 3.3 volts and zero volts or ground. So that's all that pull up or pull down resistor is doing. It's making sure you get a clean signal, in this case, a clean input of either high or low. The last line of code is in the loop section and it's this over here. We're sending the status of the float switch to node red via MQTT. Because I've pivoted this project towards the hydroponic system, I've renamed the topics and you can see that Hydro 1 is the beginning of the topic now for all of these entries. And remember that you can rename them to whatever you like, whatever's relevant to you and your project at the time. 
You can see I've also added the float switch down the bottom there. Let's test that it's actually working by just putting a quick debug node in there and we'll deploy that and have a look at the debugging. You can see that it's showing zero at the moment. If I open up the switch, then it should go to one. And there you go. So it's working perfectly fine. Switch closed and it'll go back to zero. Let's add a few nodes so we can visualize this data. First thing we need to do is go to the dashboard icon at the top here and let's add a tab to our UI. We're going to call this hydroponics. And in that tab, we're going to add a group. And we're going to call that group sensors. And let's add a couple nodes so that we can visualize this data. The first one we'll add will be the gauge and we'll add that to the float switch. So to configure that gauge, we need to go up here. You can see that it's already added it to this group because that's the only group that's available to us. Let's keep everything as it is standard so we can actually see how this works. Let's deploy that and see what the UI looks like with the new tab, the new group, and also the gauge. So we can see there is only one tab available at this moment, so it's automatically defaulting to it. But let's see what happens when I add a second tab. And we can see here we have the choice of the two different groups we've created. So I've just created another tab called Hydroponics 2, which also has a group called Sensors. So let's do that. Done. Deploy. And let's have a look at the UI. At the top here, you can click down and you can see there's multiple tabs. So we can go to Hydroponics 2, and instead of being a gauge, we can see the text. If I change the position of the sensor, we can see that text will change to one, or hopefully it will, there we go, to one. And when I change it back again, it should go back to zero, and there you go. Let's see what happens on the gauge itself. So over here, we can see it's at zero at the moment. If I pop the switch in the opposite direction, we can see there it's popped up to one. Now that's not entirely useful. Let's make a couple changes to the gauge so that it looks a bit more representative of what we're trying to do. Let's get rid of this text. We don't need that for now. I'm going to get rid of the second group as well. We don't need that. First, let's just delete the sensor because it will just, just be sitting there as an orphaned group, which you don't want. So get rid of the sensor first, then get rid of the tab. And there we go. And let's go to the gauge and let's modify this. So we know that we're getting a value of zero or one. So let's make the maximum range here one. And let's see what that does. We deployed that, we go over here. If I flip the switch on the float switch, we can see that it should go all the way to the top. And there you go. We can see that it's indicating that at the moment it's full because the water would be pushing up on the float switch. And as soon as the water is below the float switch, then it should pop back down to zero. There you go. Let's make a couple other changes to this gauge and see what options we have. So of course you can change the color. And let's do that now. Let's make this more blue. We want to show that it is full. So it'll be full of liquid and it's blue. And it doesn't really matter what we add to these two colors because when it's at zero, it's going to show nothing. It's going to be blank. So let's do that. Deploy and have a look at the gauge. So when there is liquid in the reservoir, then it's going to show blue. When it is closed and the water has run out, then it's going to show empty. Let's add a couple other nodes. First, we'll add a chart to the temperatures. So we need two of those. Humidity, we'll use a gauge for, and I'll show you how that works in just a sec. So for those two, and we need another gauge and another chart. There we go. So let's connect them up and configure them. For the humidity, we're going to change this from a gauge to level and we'll make the maximum year 100 because you can have up to 100% humidity down to zero humidity. And we'll say done and we'll do the same thing for the other humidities. We'll make them level and 100. Okay. 
Okay, let's see what we get. We're going to make some modifications to it afterwards, but let's see what this looks like without any major modification. It looks like there's little red icons on these charts. I think it just needs you to open up, make sure that everything is correct. And it is, so we're going to deploy that. Let's have a look at this data. I've changed the delay on my Arduino code to one second so that the data comes through a bit quicker so you can see the activity a bit better. So we've deployed that. Let's go to the UI. So we can see that data is moving across and the gauges are populating. We can see the charts are doing their thing as well. But this doesn't look very good. Let's make some changes so that this looks a bit nicer uh, for us to work with. First thing, well, actually, first thing we're going to do, let's go to the dashboard to the layout of the sensors tab. And let's have a look. Width, we're going to change that to, let's make it much wider. Let's make it 18. Update, deploy, and have a look. There we go. It's a bit better. Um, <laughs> we still need to make a few changes here, but let's have a look. Chart. So the first thing we're going to do is let's look at the last, let's look at the last hour. That's fine. And the X label, that's fine. We'll just make it automatic. And size, we're going to decrease that a little bit. So let's make it, let's make it nine by four. Done. Uh, is a bit better and let's put the other one next to it there's an easier way to do this so if you go on to the tab itself we can see hydroponics tab and we click on layout and we can see how this all looks here so let's start making some changes and we can move these things around so the size of these those are unlocked we can move them around but we're going to need to change the size so we can change the size of that one but the other ones are set to auto so let's just take it off auto and we'll just do that so we can modify it within the layout itself and that makes it a little bit easier to work with still haven't done this gauge which is the last one down here let's do that And now we can play around with this. So chart, we want the other chart next to it. And we'll make it a bit wider. And we'll put this other chart next to it. And gauges, so let's make them square. Just makes them look a bit better. So let's do three by three. And deploy and see what we have. So it looks a little bit neater, still some changes we can make here, and let's go and do that. So when it comes to temperature, you've got to look at what your expectation is, what your minimum and your maximum is, and that sets the range. So if you have a look in here, you can see the range here is looking a bit strange. So let's make the range minimum. Oh, I don't expect it to go below freezing, so I'm going to make this 5 degrees Celsius, but you can set it to whatever you want, and maximum should not be going anywhere past 55 degrees Celsius, else I have some problems. But you can adjust this as you go along. So we'll do that one. We'll do the same over here, 5 and 55. And let's have a look at that. So a couple other minor modifications you can make, like the label. If we have a look here, these all just say gauge. So if you just give the label a relevant name, for this one it's humidity let's say humidity one, you can give it a better name than that, but at least I can tell the difference between these. So this is humidity two, and let's say external humidity. And down here, float switch. So there we go, that's a little bit better. Let's make those things a little bit bigger so we can actually see them properly and also so that the text doesn't take over. And you can see there's also something else that we need to change and that's what the units are. Here it says units. Let's just make that percentage because humidity is a percentage. Change that. And that's already a little bit better. 
So I'm going to make a few other changes to this, uh, make this look a bit prettier, and then I'll come back to you and we can see what the end result looks like. So this looks a lot better than what it looked like before. Again, it's just playing around with some of the settings that are there by default. You could do some clever stuff as well by using CSS. You can really make this look fancy. And there are some other nodes you can include as well to do some very cool stuff with your dashboards. If you want to take it to another level, there are things like Grafana that you can install and you can do some pretty cool things with that as well. But at the end of the day, this works very well and I've been quite happy with it. Now, something to point out, if you're looking at temperature one and temperature two, these are the two sensors that are connected, the BME 280 sensors that are connected via the I squared C bus. Now, the problem with I squared C is when you run it over long lengths, sometimes you get some errant uh, figures coming through. So you can see here, this is spiking down and spiking up in different places. Now, what I typically do is I do a check within my Arduino code. Here we can see the logic I've put in place. So it checks whether temperature one or temperature two are either smaller than 55 or bigger than minus 10. And it's doing that only on temperature because you don't need to check the humidity at the same time. If the temperature is giving weird readings, then the humidity will also give weird readings. So we just need to check the one. And that there should make a big difference. So let's go back to our code. I'm going to reboot my Raspberry Pi so that the values will reset because we can see that they're still showing the historical. So let me quickly reboot and then we'll be able to see a bit better reflection of the temperature and humidity. Let's have a look at what it looks like now. Well, that's a bit better. Let's uh, increase the temperature by holding one of the sensors and we can see the change. I don't know which sensor this is. We'll see very soon. So it's actually sensor one. I'm just breathing on it. That's why the humidity is going up as well. So we can definitely see it working and it's nice to see it doing it in near real time by having a one second delay. And it quickly is gonna come back down to the ambient temperature when I let it go. And if we flip the float switch up and down, we can see that that changes as we move it. So I'm closing it now, which means that it's empty reservoir is empty. If I pop it up again, that means that the reservoir is full again. So we can easily see that. One last thing I want to show you before we finish up this video is the ability to take multiple inputs into a single chart. This is quite handy to be able to compare sensor readings that are on the same scale. And in this example, we have temperature one, temperature two, and temperature external all going through to this one chart node. If we go into the chart node, there's not much different here than we've seen on the other charts that we've created. The one thing you might want to do is enable the legend. So just click show and that just makes it clear which input is which when you're looking at them all on the same chart. The other thing here is the series colors. So the way this works is the top three are going to be used because there's only three inputs. But if there were more inputs, then it would use more of these colors. So blue, green, and orange are going to be used. And make sure these colors are very different from each other so that it's easier to see the data on the chart itself. And another thing to point out as well, try and align these colors with the same colors on the charts that you have coming individually from those inputs. So for example, external temperature, I have that set to orange. So the first series color here is going to align to that because there's only one input. So I've made that orange because over here the third input is orange. So you'll see it'll make sense in a sec. Let's deploy this and have a look at what it looks like. We can see that these different colors, so external temperature is orange and on this side here as well, temperature external is orange. And it makes it nice and easy to see the difference over time when all the lines are on the same graph. There you go, that's your first dashboard that you've created. It's pretty easy, have a play around, fiddle with the different settings and uh, get it looking the way that you want it to look. And I will see you again very soon on the next episode where we will send data from our dashboard back to our ESP32 so we can control things. Until then, stay safe and stay spicy.